It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm really looking forward to talking with my guest today. Joining me is Michael Saka. He's host of the great podcast, Rocket Ship FM. Rocket Ship FM. I'm sorry, I can't speak today. <laughs> and uh, head of partnerships at Crew, which he's going to explain to us a little bit what Crew does. Michael, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Well, good. Well, take a minute first to introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Michael Saka, as you said, I host uh, Rocket Ship for the last about two and a half years. And um, a great podcast. People should be listening to. I mean, whether they're an entrepreneur <laughs> or not, the. Uh, just the way you put that together, it's it's very well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, and I, I lead partnerships and business development at Crew. Um, Crew is a we help match freelance projects with our crew, our our crew of vetted uh, designers and developers. And so the whole idea is to make freelance life a little bit easier for people um, who are freelance designers and developers. So we've we've built a bunch of systems around that, and now we're, we're going after bigger customers, and that's kind of where I come in with our partnerships. Excellent. So it's sort of like a uh, curated Upwork, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so it, it kind of like the, the tier up in mm-hmm. price from, mm-hmm. from Upwork, um, and we, we curate both sides. So, so we vet not the projects coming in, and we vet the... Um, the contractors and the freelancers that are on the network. Great. So tell us a little bit about Rocket Ship then. Yeah. So Rocket Ship um, is a podcast we started about two and a half years ago. We started it because we simply wanted to learn more. Um, we were kind of at the beginning stages of products. And, and I was running an agency at the time. Uh, Matt and Joel had just left an agency. And we, we we really wanted to be entrepreneurs, uh, but we we just didn't know exactly what to do. So we figured we'll start a podcast and start interviewing people to learn. And that's kind of what happened. We were going to do it for like four months, and we were going to write a book about what we learned. And the podcast just kind of took off for us, and so we couldn't stop. And so we've been doing two episodes a week since 2014. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I mean, the great thing about podcasts, and I, I tell people this, I mean, I started mine six months ago, and we go five days a week, and we're talking about accelerated growth strategies for companies, and I've been in business much, much longer than you have been, um, <laughs> <laughs> and but I still did it from the same motivation as for me, as I wanted to keep on learning. Yeah. I mean, you just can't ever stop engaging with the topic and your profession and, and trying to develop yourself. And certainly listening to podcasts is a great way to do that, but putting one on is even a better way, <laughs> somewhat selfishly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good skills that come in, you know, just from learning how to talk to people and learning how to interview. Um, exactly. And that really has helped with sales and becoming more comfortable on the phone, um, especially because with the podcast, oftentimes you're talking to people, at least we were, we were like reaching out to people who we really admired. Mm-hmm. So we were, we were almost scared to get on the calls, you know, the first 20 or so, because there were people that we had looked up to for so long. But, you know, once, once we got over that, it really helped with, you know, talking to people that we didn't know and building a rapport and just those basic sales skills, um, which I didn't even realize we were building. But when I started doing sales, it was, it was much easier than it had been before. Wow. Where was my call? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> now I know where I stand. Okay. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to remedy that. So, all right. So you've, you've been posting a really interesting series on rocket ship on sales for your entrepreneurial audience and you talk about demystifying sales. So why did you feel you needed to demystify sales? Because so many like so many articles that we read today about, you know, building a business, it kind of paints sales in a negative light. A lot of people just have a negative connotation about sales. It's, you know, used car sales. It's uh, something that, you know, companies don't do today is the perception, although they absolutely do. Um, but it's just not what's written about. And so we felt like we wanted to try to paint sales in an approachable light, um, in in the light that we had experienced sales, which is really just building networking and and building rapport with people and having a conversation with people. That's really all sales is, is telling people about what you're doing um, to see if if they're interested as well. And so we want, just wanted to, to kind of take a new look at it 
and still tactical, but approachable. For mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things that, that certainly technical entrepreneurs have, have problems with when it comes to sales is this idea, as you sort of talked about, the stereotypical, hey, we're, we're trying to persuade someone to buy something they don't need or want. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you had to sort of build up a consensus based on the people you spoke with, and you know, what if you had to define sales? This may be a little bit of a leading question because I've got my own definition. But what's what's your definition of sales? Well, so I mean, there's there's I mean, they're selling ice to an ice Eskimo, Eskimo, right? Um, and, and but for me, sales is really about um, that personal connection to selling your product, to literally getting your product in the hands of your customers. And I think what we've done recently is automate that, and it falls more in marketing. Um, but I do think that sales, that, that point where you're talking to your customer is the sale. Um, and and when you're finding out and solving your customer's problem is the sale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I bring up, because I in researching my most recent book about sales called Amp Up Your Sales, you know, I found this great quote from Jeff Bezos uh, about mm. what sales is. And to me, it sort of most perfectly captured sales. And after decades of being in it and business to business and business to consumer, I was like, ah, this, this really gets it. And then his quote was in an interview he did in the Harvard Business Review where he said that, you know, we don't make money when we sell things. We make money when we help customers make purchase decisions. And I thought that is sales, right? Helping yeah. your customer make a purchase decision. If if you do anything in your interactions with a, a buyer, a prospect that is not in support of helping them making a, a, a purchase decision, then you're wasting their time and yours. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, it's just a great a great quote. Um, so that's and that's really, I think, sort of a mindset change, though, because you said this stereotype exists of salespeople, but unfortunately it sort of exists for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, we've all run into the, the stereotypical sales. Um, we've all been a part of a stereotypical sale where we haven't felt comfortable, where we feel like we're, we're being pushed into make a decision. And, and that's not what we talk about in the series. Um, we approach it from it, more like Bezos. How do you help your customer and, and how do you you build a relationship? It's not just about getting one, um, you know, getting them to buy something today now. Um, it's really about can you solve their problem? Do they have a, a, the same problem that you can solve? And if not, you walk away. It, it's okay to to not make that sale if you're not the right fit for them. And it's really a service. And I think for technical entrepreneurs that are getting into to business, and this is this is the big barrier for them is is that they can put it in the mode of or put their mindset in the framework of this is a service I'm providing selling as a service I'm providing to this prospect to help them make this decision. It changes things for them pretty significantly. I mean, I've in my past life when I was managing large sales teams and bring and often I made sort of a practice of bringing people from the engineering side of the house into sales because they had the product expertise that the customers really needed is they're always reluctant. But when you start saying, okay, well, yeah, but this is really a service problem. You're not trying to persuade or convince them to do something they don't want to do. You're providing a service to help them make this decision. Then suddenly the light bulb goes on. Mm-hmm. And I think for technical, entre- technical entrepreneurs, I think that's really a, a key, key thought they need to keep in mind. Yeah, and not to avoid it. I think a lot of entrepreneurs avoid the sales process mm-hmm. because we have so much automation. And because we we have so many, we have so much data that we're tracking, and we we are focused on moving people automatically through a funnel, that oftentimes the the actual human touch, which is which is what could could be the difference between converting a customer and having them slip away, is something that we avoid. We we try to to figure out, you know, can we change the button color? Can we you know change our onboarding flow? Can we give them more education? Can we build a a drip email campaign that gets them to sign up? But what we don't do is pick up the phone and and call them um, or set up a meeting to go see them in person, um, which could be the difference between making the sale and and not. Um, and it could be the difference between growth and uh, and failure in a young business. But there seems to be this push along that lines to continually increase the level of automation and sales. I, mean, I was looking mm-hmm. at a website last night, actually for another guest I'm going to interview later today. 
that was all about almost completely automating the sales process. And it seems like there's real dangers for that for a company when you think about it. If, if you said, if you're willing, if you want to avoid that, that human to human touch and you want to automate your entire sales process, then, you know, if you're not providing any value through how you sell the product, you're just a commodity. Right. Yep. Um, you're, you're, and, and, I, but I also think, um, I think there's something strange about wanting to avoid people. And, and <laughs> that, that to me is kind of, that might be um, a red flag in, in maybe this isn't the right path. If, if, the, if our whole goal is for businesses to avoid people, but yet build services for people, how do we know when we're actually solving the problem that people face it every day? Oh, exactly, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think people know. I mean, it's, it's interesting though, because there's, I remember a time back in, that was about eight, nine years ago, we were raising money at the company I was with, and we raised a fair amount of money. But, you know, there's some VCs in the Valley that we just couldn't speak to because they said, look, we're not going to invest in any company that requires a sales team. Hmm. Yeah. And it's funny how this sort of changed given the advent of SaaS <laughs> and how, how, how big that is. But that was really important. I think there's still some people, investors at this time, even in the Valley, that still hold on to that, that you know, why can't we do this better? Salespeople just sort of, you know, a necessary inconvenience at this point in time. And if we could engineering them out of the process, we'd be much better off. But I think, you know, we, before the sales series, we did a series on funding and, um, and what we found was, I mean, we were interviewing people kind of on the changing attitude of venture capital. Mm -hmm. And so I think that attitude was very prevalent for probably the last, you know, five years to a decade. Um, but what we're seeing now is that people are focused on revenue. And so when they focus on revenue, sales is suddenly back in the equation. Yeah. Um, be because especially for a B2B business, uh, it is hard to hit revenue numbers that are significant enough to raise venture capital if you're not at if you don't have a sales team that's able to, to bring your product into large organizations and enterprise organizations, automation simply doesn't work for those use cases. And yet still, you're seeing even in, certainly in the front end of the, the top of the funnel, the SDR function, the sales development function, that increasing amounts of automation going in there. And that's, that's sort of interesting because there's this debate now about, well, how do SDRs continue to add value or not even continue, how do they add value at all into this this process? And you know, couldn't they all just be replaced by really effective inbound marketing? Right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's still it's still out there, right? It's still out there to be seen. Um, I know at at crew, we are still very manual. Um, I mean, we obviously use tools to help speed up like finding emails and some of the the manual search. Uh, but everything else is still very, um, very high touch. Mm -hmm. And because we have very specific people that we need to hit and it's hard to automate that. I've tried to use services that, you know, build leads for you and, right. but they, they just, they're, they're not good enough. Um, and, and they don't know what the company looks like. They only know the stats that it's given, you know, how many employees they have or what what is the role of this person. But it, it's hard for them to know what work that person has done and um, who that person is outside of just being, you know, a creative director at a, a large agency. So how's Which your is, sales force structured at Crew? So I have a guy um, who he's in Montreal and he does all of our kind of top of the funnel lead generation. Mm-hmm. And so he set. He basically is emailing um, our our targets and and trying to be, open up the doors. And then I have um, myself and uh, the other salespeople are actually the ones that take all the meetings. So he sets up the meetings for the sales team, and then it, we try to do in house meetings uh, every two to three months in in like New York and San Francisco and our big cities. Mm -hmm. And then the rest we do obviously over the phone. But even when we have a phone meeting, we try to go see them in person, um, you know, within a couple months. That's always our goal uh, for this because we found that 
the phone is great, but once we get in person, it's it's uh, it changes the relationship. And like I've walked into offices where we had you know long phone meetings. They were like, "Yes, it sounds great." Um, they might they didn't convert right to a customer, but you know it sounded like we were well on our way. When I walked into the in person meeting, they they barely remembered who I was and mm-hmm. what he did uh, because they take so many phone calls that we just kind of became a wash. And exactly. you know maybe that that talks to my sales skills. No, but, no, I think it just speaks <laughs> to the environment. I mean, that's that's it's the crazy. thing that I think people are are really not as mindful about as they should is that yeah, you know, customers are being deluged with undifferentiated messaging coming from lots and lots of vendors. Absolutely, and in any one space, just given the amount of competition there is, at, at the end of the day, unless you've somehow distinctly differentiated yourself, they've just conflated what what you do with what everybody else does, and so yeah. you all look alike. Right. So once we walked into the office, we sat down for an hour. We talked about, you know, we basically started from the beginning and the next day they were active, you know, and, and they've been one of our, our best partners since. And mm-hmm. it's all to the power of getting off of our butt and, you know, going and, and seeing them in person and making that effort and standing out in their mind now because now they have a face to the name, not just a Skype call. Which, as I said, is a huge differentiator, and it really came from how you sold, right? You made that decision to go visit them, where many companies wouldn't. Right. And given you made some, obviously, a calculation based on what you presume are the lifetime value of that customer could be, that it made sense (laughs) in terms of your cost of acquisition to go make that call. Right. Right. And that's, you know, and we've, we've built it into our whole process. So, you know, we have, you know, our goal is to get in person with our, with our big partners every two to three months and especially a couple months after having that initial conversation with them. Cause we found that the relationship is just completely different. Um, it's not anything that we could automate. We need a body to, to go and a smiling face to go in and talk to them, build that relationship. Well, it's based on emotions. Yeah. So, you know, it's a great saying people make emotional decisions for logical reasons. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and what it speaks to is that when when researchers do brain scans of people making decisions, is they find that the emotional side is activated first. So fundamentally your prospects, your buyers are making emotional decisions to buy from you that they backfill with the logic. Mm. There's a great yep. a great study that that uh, somebody wrote about last week or the week before our um, I forget exactly when, but it was a study of of the role of emotions and decision making. And there were some people that uh, these doctors were studying this group of people who, uh, because of a brain injury, weren't able to feel emotion basically. And what they found is these people basically were paralyzed; they couldn't make. Even simple decisions like, but what to eat for lunch. So you think yeah. about, we tend to think that, you know, hey, lunch, you know, simple day to day decisions, little things, you know, we're just making rag- rational, logical decisions. But all of our decision making is really guided by emotions. It's pretty, um, it's pretty telling. Yeah. So in your case, yeah. you think about it. I mean, what was the difference when you got in front of the prospect? Well, you you were able to develop this emotional connection, and they with you, that just didn't exist before. Yep, absolutely. And, so, and they remembered us after that. And after that, it was memorable. <laughs> exactly. From, exactly. From the sea of, of other competitors, you know? Yeah, so. we used to, I remember back a few years ago, back when I was, was working for companies, some startups that we were selling large, multi-million dollar communication systems. And... You know, we knew, and this was really before the day of, of video conferencing and so on, is, is that we knew that we had to get in front of the prospects. And a lot of our competition just thought it was too expensive, because most of the business was overseas, <laughs> too expensive mm-hmm. just to get up and go. Yep. I mean, we'd basically get up and go to Europe and serve <laughs> cold call people for a week. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, yeah, it made a huge difference. Yep. And I actually found the easiest time to get in touch with someone is when you're in their city. Yes. Or when you're not. Like, because I can send long sales emails, short sales emails for six months, never get a response. But if I say, hey, I'm down the street, want to get a cup of coffee tomorrow, I usually will get, you know, probably a 50% response rate as opposed to a a 5% response rate on my cold emails. Yeah. No, even more. I find yeah. Yeah, yeah. I could be in 
Hong Kong and pick up a phone and call a customer in Hong Kong that didn't know I was going to be there. And I almost always got in. Yep. And I don't even have to sell. They don't, I don't have to give any premise about what we're doing. I just, I work for crew, want to grab a coffee tomorrow. You have 15 minutes. And, and just that, just the, 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 the notion that, you know, we'll be here in person, there'll be that mm-hmm. human element and we're just going to have a conversation changes the game um, in terms of opening up doors. And so we've made that a practice to, you know, when we travel to a city, I, I wait until, you know, a couple of days before I'll set up meetings with our, our known partners. And then a couple of days before I'll start sending out coffee invitations. And that's how we usually fill up our schedule. It's a great way to do it for people listening. It's a great tip. I mean, I, what I used to do and, and still do on occasion is say similar thing, wait a few days before and say, Hey, I'm going to be in New York city in a couple of days. Yeah. Do you have time for coffee? Yep. People always do. I mean, it's, it's very reliable. Yeah, it's it's so simple. Right? Yeah, 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 and it's, yeah, it's so simple things. And again, it's such a differentiator uh, at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah, great stuff. So, I was going to ask you. So, what was the most surprising thing? Last or question on your your series that people should make make a point of going and listening to is what was the most surprising thing you learned about sales? Um, the most surprising thing. I don't know. That's a tough one. I don't know if there was a a surprising point because I felt like a lot of it was the head nods. Like, yep, it, it's just like it's the obvious stuff that you know but you don't do. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of it was um was was kind of going back to the basics of of sales and and really just having a conversation with someone. So, you know, we we learned from we talked to Craig Wartman, who's a, a business yes. teacher in in Chicago. He's fantastic. But, you know, we talked to him and, and we we learned about objections and kind of stepping back. And some of the obvious stuff when when someone has an objection, the the your first instinct is just to answer it, right? And and move on with the conversation. But, you know, he, he was talking about taking a step back, learning why they have that objection, figuring out what what, you know, what is the emotional root of that objection and then handling the objection once you fully understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And just stuff like that was, they were just amazing reminders of, you know, I'll take eight phone calls a day and I will, I will screw that up every time. But when I go back and and I listen to that, or we have a conversation like that, um, I start to repractice some of those skills. So that, that though, it was those kind of things that really, that really helped and have really stood out to me in the series. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Because I think that the sort of the constant about sales is that there are certain basics that you have to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And my first book in particular, Zero Time Selling, was just about that. Is you could whole point is you could have any sales methodology you wanted, but if you weren't practicing these basics, then it didn't really matter what methodology you're using. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And I think that those those are constants that people need to pay attention to. And as you said, a you know good example is how do you handle and work with an objection. I mean, I think Craig's approach is a great approach. I mean, to me, you know, objections and saying, well, this is, yeah, you want to step back because what the objection really is, is an unanswered question. Mm-hmm. The customer needs information about something and we haven't provided it. And so in the absence of that information, they have this objection. So you have to step back and say, okay, what what's driving that? So great point for him there. So Michael, I've got some Standard questions asked all my guests, and the first one is a hypothetical scenario. And in this scenario, you, Michael, have just been hired as the VP of sales at a company whose sales have pretty much stalled out. <laughs> they sort of lost the recipe, and the CEO is really anxious. The board's really anxious for you to come in and turn things around. So what two things could you do your first week in the job that would have the biggest impact? Uh, the first thing I would probably do. Um, great question, by the way. I, Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever been in this position, but um, is definitely talk to the existing customers, and I, I think figuring out what what why they're with you, um, and that value prop that they have, um, especially if I hadn't sold the product before, would be essential to to learning how do I find new customers, and then how do I how do I 
express the the value proposition that my customers feel because uh, obviously there's there's probably two things wrong there um, the marketing and the inbound I assume has stalled which means the messaging to the public is probably off which you can learn from you know interviewing your existing customers and mm-hmm. testing out different value propositions and your outbound is probably stalled which means you may have either saturated the the one market that you've been going after and you need to find a new vertical or you need to um, you need to find a different value proposition because the market has changed, uh, and and you need to learn why your customers are currently with you in order to to obtain new ones. I think the other thing you could look at is do your customers have you know is there revenue that you could generate from your existing customers that you may be leaving on the table through mm-hmm. new services or specialized services for them, um, and is that that a revenue channel for you um, instead of going out and spending money to acquire new customers, which is obviously more expensive. Got it. Great answer. All right. So now some more rapid fire questions. You can give me one word answers or you can elaborate if you wish. The first one is when you, Michael Saka, are out selling, you are selling, you yourself are selling. So what's your most powerful sales attribute? Um, smiling on the phone. <laughs> as stupid as that sounds, I think if you can get people to smile on the other line, on the other end, be it a video chat or or um, or on a phone call in the first minute or so, if you can get them to to chuckle or giggle or something, um, it makes the rest of the call so much easier. There's so many times I get on the call with people who just don't want to talk to me, uh, but if I can turn them around on that first minute, I'm good. If I can't, it's usually a difficult phone call. All right. So, what's your secret to getting them to chuckle on the first minute? Oh, I don't, it, it's all, it's very personal, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it's trying to learn about them and, and figure out, so it's either research beforehand um, to know kind of what they're into. If not, it's, it's just a quick, like trying to, to find something relatable. Is it like something in their city is an event that they, that they may have attended? Is it something that they like in the design community? Is it a, for me, it, there's a lot of design stuff. So is, is there a recent article that, um, you know, I can try to get their quick opinion on and, and, and make a joke about I don't know you know Mm -hmm. but it's all very personal but it's trying to to find that common ground quickly I think a basic sales tactic um, but I always try to be smiling on the phone when I do it I do find that that somehow makes a difference whereas if I'm bored they're bored so um, so that that's kind of that's generally how I I gauge how a sales call is going to go is is the first minute enjoyable conversation because if it's not I'm probably in trouble it's a great tip I mean, for people thinking, listening to this, is is yeah, smile, have fun when you call because that that translates, it communicates itself over the connection yeah. to the person listening and talking to you. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, now the next question. So, who's your sales role model? Sales role model. Um, that's tough. You know, we've talked to Steli, mm-hmm. uh, Steli FD from Close.io, a number of times, and I'm always incredibly inspired um, by his his wisdom and his insight into the sales process um, you know his philosophies on following up um, his his you know maybe is what's killing your startup um, right. all the way through to a lot of the emotional uh, stuff that he talks about with sales and kind of getting over those initial emotional hurdles because you know as sales people we face so much rejection that um and he he handles it in such an elegant way and 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 with a ton of energy more energy than i certainly have um that uh he's he's someone that i always go back to for inspiration when i'm looking for kind of new ideas in my sales process okay great stelly ft good so what's one book every salesperson should read so I just read um, The Machine by mm-hmm. Justin Rothmarsh, right. which was all about setting up uh, your sales team. And it was his philosophy on how to set up, you know, the how to organize your sales team. And it's something that I took directly into crew with having kind of an, a, an administrative uh, lead who is setting up all the meetings for the entire sales team. And so I took a lot of what he wrote about in the book um, into crew. And so that has that has really helped me kind of formulate how to build a sales team uh, that might be slightly different than um, having each salesman or sure. woman basically generate their own leads. Right. Okay. Great. The Sales Machine, Justin Roth Marsh. Good book. Um, last question for you then. So what what music's on your playlist these days? 
Oh man, I listen to a lot of records these days. Actually, oh, okay, I've, Very I've been cool. trying to go back from back like the vinyl. digital playlist. Yeah, so um, right now I have um, a Monk record on. Yeah, and and I'll just put that on throughout the day in between calls. I just kind of drop the needle uh, in between, and and that's actually been awesome because I kind of feel like I get to gets me away from the screen and the digital in a, in, mm-hmm. in one particular way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that actually has been really really helpful and purposeful because when I listen to a record, I listen to the whole record as opposed to a a single song or maybe a a long playlist by various artists. So that's just me. I'm kind of a a geek with, with music. Um, a rocket ship FM used to be known for like all of our outro music. So, um, but I, yeah, I've tried to, I've tried to go back and just listen to, to albums that I can put on and, and listen to in a single song. A little bit of jazz. It sounds like. Yeah, I listen to jazz. I listen to a lot of electronic, Fortet, um, Aphex Twin, that kind of stuff. And then I listen to a lot of indie rock. Um, so I, I have a you know pretty eclectic collection. It just depends on what you're doing and what mood you're in. So how many vinyl records do you own right now? Um, probably close to, I don't know, 75, 100. All right, that's a pretty good size collection. Yeah, not bad. We're working on it. I'm trying yeah. to get, <laughs> try to buy a couple a month. So. <laughs> I know somewhere in storage, I've got a couple hundred that are yeah. <laughs> probably worth something. Some of them, yeah, they, maybe. They, maybe. Well, yeah, they date back quite a ways. I mean, some I inherited from older siblings that uh, you know were living through the the uh, the beginnings of the rock revolution. So. With Discogs is the it's a great great site for selling and and buying what's it called discogs all right i'll check it out it's pretty awesome yeah all right yeah probably more in the selling mode than the buying but all right well michael it's been great talking to you thanks for joining me today yeah no thank you so much i really appreciate it and everything that you're that you're doing here is is amazing so so tell folks how they can find out more about crew and rocket ship fm yeah, so if you have a project uh, that you want to do, go to crew.co and you can start your website, app, branding, design, whatever it would be. And then um, rocketship.fm, you can find on rocketship.fm uh, the site or go to iTunes and search, search Rocketship FM and you could find all, it's about 250 of our episodes now. Excellent. Well, great. Well, again, thanks for joining me. Thank you. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new, as you did today, to help you accelerate your success. And easy way to learn something new is to make this podcast a part of your daily routine, whether you listen on your commute, in the gym, or make it part of your morning sales meeting. That way you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Michael Saka, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.